2010 UTT, UTT conference on, on law and economics. Two global leading professors on law and economics will present their papers this afternoon. Firstly, Emeritus Professor of Law Ian McKay from Montreal University will present his paper, The Attraction and Traction of, of Law and Economics. Secondly, Professor Thomas Eulen from University of Illinois College of Law will present his piece, The Role of Law in Economic Growth and Development. Professor McKay, the room is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, perhaps I should start by asking for, for your indulgence for speaking English to you. Um, this, this may require some effort, but then I try to help you by putting things on the board and going along as, as we speak. Um, after the very learned presentations that you've heard before the um, uh, break, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to be very much more trivial uh, but I do want to um, deal with a question that's puzzled me. Um, as you remember, Luciano Tim mentioned these doing business reports, and these are related to uh, what in the North American literature is known as the legal origin movement. And the legal origin movement had its, one of its ideas that civil law systems were perform uh, performing less well than common law systems, and some commentators have even extrapolated that to the point of saying it's all rent-seeking in civil law systems and it's no good and law and economics has nothing useful to do there. My point to you will be to say that that's absolutely wrong. But then there's a second point which is that um, in the world at large, if you look at all different countries, all of them, or most of them, have now become aware of law and economics and of the useful services it can render, and yet nowhere, nowhere has law and economics uh, the recognition, the traction that it has in the United States. And so my second point will be to discuss with you what traction it does have in our countries, uh, what we can do with it usefully. So let me jump into my first topic, where, where does the attraction of law and economics come from? Um, when I went through um, my legal education in Europe, and Tom, you and I are now at the stage where this is a long time ago, <laughs> um, at least six years for me, um, law was taught as a collection of rules, procedures, institutions, um, that you had to learn by heart. And at the exams, you were expected to reproduce these, or if they were oral exams, you to tell the professor what he told you a few months before. Um, and law was more or less presented as an algorithmic exercise, sorry, yes, uh, as an algorithmic exercise um, applied more or less mechanically the practice of law was mostly a matter of interpreting law texts, code texts or texts of the supreme jurisdictions or even lower court decisions, but that was your main menu. And at best, gaps in this beautiful systematic structure were to be filled by our sense of justice and fairness. You could then uh, let your creative talents flow. From outside of the legal community, this view corresponds to law as a black box, nothing to understand in that, or even a, a language kept secrets from the common people. And for some, uh, it was a tool to keep the uh, privileged, um, uh, to keep the privileged in their privileged position and to keep the underprivileged in their situation. Now, um, in the 1960s, uh, or by the 1960s, law was still taught, I think, that way, as I discovered when I went to comparative law conference, in all sorts of other countries within Europe, and I suppose even within the United States. Law was taught in this black letter mode, uh, both in common law systems and in civil law systems. And you might have thought that 1968, for those, who, uh, for, for those of us who were around at that time, might have changed some of these things. If you were in Paris, um, the, the whole university world was in a total standstill discussing about what it was really about. So, um, 
lawn economics uh, brought about what you might really call a conceptual revolution. And I remember in the 70s, you couldn't open a law review in the United States where you wouldn't find at least one article, and sometimes the whole lot of them, trying to apply law and economics insight to yet new institutions that we hadn't thought about. It was like a new tool that absolutely fascinated the legal community. Um, it's carried over in the late 70s to other English-speaking countries, including Toronto, where I uh, came into contact with it. Then in the 80s to uh, Europe and further afield. Essentially, if you try to summarize what the difference is, where the revolution is, perhaps I could put it this way with two questions. Um, we were talking about these paintings and so forth, and um, uh, very fortunately, my colleague had already brought up. So, if a seller unwittingly sells a masterpiece to an expert, should it be allowed, be heard, to demand the annulment of that contract on the ground of error? Legal question. Law and economics adds to that question another dimension, which is what incentive effects do we buy if we are going to let that go forward? These are the questions that law and economics asks. It's not in replacement of this, it's in addition to this. So, the, and the funny thing is, if you ask this question, you go through the exercise, as we did a bit before the break, throughout civil law, civil law, you discover that most of the existing law looks as if it has been put together in a uniform logic that um, makes sense in terms of the right incentives for people to be careful, avoid others from falling into traps, uh, making cooperation possible where otherwise people might be too mistrustful. So there is a sort of unifying underlying logic and in civil systems, and this is my submission to you, in civil law systems, um, perhaps the exercise of detecting this logic is even facilitated. But in fact, we have a code where people have already tried to systematize these kinds of insights. And much of the civil law that you'll find in codes, the older rules, reflect a logic that you could interpret as efficiency. That is an interesting insight, and for those who write scholarly books, this is very interesting heuristic to keep present in your mind. Now, of course, we all know law doesn't have mere, uh, law's not merely logic, it is, it has a social function. And that means that we, ha we must look at the effect of rules. And we must also, where we can, try to look at how it actually works in society, the empirical side of things. At the same time, law and economics allows you to do something else, very interesting. You can think about how else matters might be regulated. Think the unthinkable. That is a very worthwhile skill to have. So, um, my view is, um, my submission to you is, that law and economics for this social agenda is the most powerful tool around. If you try to do an analysis of good faith, drawing on sociology of law, or anthropology of law, or you name it, any of the law and the elephant disciplines, you won't get very far. Law and economics outperforms all of the other ones around. Um, but it is, um, I should say, there's a holy trinity there. Law and economics um, should be joined with comparative law. And I think it adds force to comparative law because law and economics is a functional language which can tell you when you look at a different system uh, what things are comparable. Things that have very different names in English law, for instance, do work in somewhat similar way. Now, to see that analogy, law and economics provides you tools, very useful. And it should also be joined with history. You don't learn history simply to be aware of what went on before. You learn history because you must think that our ancestors were as rational as we were. And so if they adopted new institutions, there must have been good reasons for those. And you must be able to trace those. And when those institutions disappeared, you must be able to trace the reasons why that's so. Now here again, law and economics 
provides tools to put structure to that exercise. So the whole of Trinity is law and economics, comparative law, and the history of law together. And I want to, um, and let me see, I must actually keep, uh, how, do I, how am I doing for time now? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Very good. Okay. Well, well. I, I want to illustrate it, uh, to you with a very simple example um, how this works. And the example I'm taking is one all of, all of us civil lawyers know, and this is how you handle stolen goods, right? Uh, the... the sale a non domino, as it's called, a Latin phrase. Somebody sells something that doesn't belong to him, the original owner traces it, and we now have a problem. So um, let me say by way of introduction, of course, that um, as we are concerned about money laundering, I suppose these problems were laundering of stolen goods. And so how did the law deal with it? In part by criminal law. If you know who stole it, you get on with the thief, you may even put an electronic bracelet on him now, um, but in part you deal with it with this, uh, through civil law, and civil law has provisions about these things, and I'm just giving you here in translation the French provisions. Um, the in sale, you say, if you sell something that doesn't belong to you, that sale normally is null, void, and uh, later on in the provisions on prescription, um, you say that uh, in case of movables, possession is title. These are the French provisions. Um, I assume that most civil codes have similar devices about. Now, um, I don't want to go into the detail of the things, but what interests me is the um, problem behind it. So here, what's the problem with the stolen good? The thief is not to be found, right? So we now have a problem um, between the original owner and the good faith purchaser. And the question is, who should be made to bear the brunt? And in principle, you say, civil law principle, property is protected, right? So give it back to the original owner. But if you want to have a second-hand market where people go and buy things, it's very useful to have a second-hand market. If things move to uh, people who have good use for them, absolutely helpful. Well, then you must uh, uh, support the function of that market, and that means you, to some extent, you have to protect appearances. This is what legal scholarship normally says about this story. How do you resolve this conflict? Well, if you go into traditional scholarship, um, if I were now before the students, I would say, what does your national system do? What does Argentinian law say about this problem? Well, let's shortcut that. Um, in my own system, when I read traditional legal scholarship on this problem, they will say, well, yeah, all right, normally property is protected, but occasionally um, you, the principle of reliance on appearances overrides it. Uh, but then they say, well, only purchasers who buy in good faith and you actually pay for it will be protected. And then that's the way they account for these funny little rules. What does economics have to say about this? Economics sees this as a sort of an accident. And if you talk about accidents in economics, you ask yourself, who could take precautions to avoid that accident? And normally, you'd like to put the burden of particular precautions on the people who can take those at less than the risk you avoid. And as between two parties, you would like to put them on the person who can take them most cheaply. Um, so let's see if this works. Um, let's begin with the owner, the original owner. Um, normally we make the distinction between voluntary loss and involuntary loss of possession, dispossession. If you give your watch to the repairman, voluntary loss, and that repairman sells it on, right? Uh, then normally the law says, well, um, you may not get it back, but the economic side of that is simply you are the best person, the best placed person to decide whether that person is trustworthy or not. And so you should take those precautions. If you, if you don't, voluntary loss but things being stolen on, uh, then the third party is, has a better right, is more protected than you will be. You are penalized for your lack of care. On the other hand, if you were careful and um, your dispossession was a matter of theft or, or loss, then things become a bit more complicated and we now have to look 
uh, at what the other party should do. So here we go. On the purchaser's side, we we're now in the case of involuntary dispossession of the original owner. So um, normally you say the purchaser must hand over the good to owners who trace it, right? Protection of property. But if the purchaser took the precaution of buying in a market or from a dealer in similar ware, when the formulas may vary a bit, then uh, the owners must reimburse. They can still claim their good, but they must pay the price that the original purchaser has uh, forked over. What's the interest in that rule? Well, you see, um, normally, law and economics, efficiency consideration, would say you leave things in the hands where they are most valued, where they are valued highest. Um, who makes that decision? Well, in this case, we say um, we like to uh, f put that decision to the original owner. So we say, all right, your purchase, the purchaser paid this price. If you value it more, you can get it back. If you value it less, it stays in the hands of the purchaser. In either case, the good will move to the hands in which it's valued most highly. Finally, bad faith purchasers are, of course, never protected. That is uh, immediately obvious in an incentive logic perspective. So what have we seen here? Quick sketch. It's obvious that there is a division of burdens between the parties that has something to do with uh, the cost of taking precautions. Uh, it looks like an efficient organization of matters. Um, and so, of course, in our day, uh, the practical uh, importance of these rules is, is diminished tremendously because of insurance. But what I want to show, if you go through the civil code this way, all through you find this kind of logic. So there is an underlying, as it were, efficiency logic which whoever codified, consolidated these rules, um, installed in it, perhaps even be without being aware of it. Good. Now, so we have a very interesting tool to get a handle on why law is what it is. But um, we also see that it's... Um, oh, there you again, Tom. Um, yeah, you're going to be haunted by that article, but it was a very good one, actually. Um, the traction of this approach is, outside the United States, is still relatively moderate. Practitioners are doubtful or hesitant, and so the question is, why? And that's what I want to um, devote my, uh, the second half of my presentation to. Traditional legal reasoning, and again, you all know this, um, of focuses on the resolution of individual cases, right? Using causa positum, Latin formula. Um, it relies heavily on the interpretation of text, and there may be legislation, code, or there may be case law, but you interpret text, and disputes arise because either parties disagree about facts or because they in, uh, disagree about what those texts mean or which texts are applicable. So text interpretation is a key feature of law as apparently it's being practiced. Law and economics, Law and economics could indicate how to interpret a text so as, to uh, so as to arrive at the efficient results. Probably we could, we could render terms in it, but the question is, why don't we do it? Or why do practitioners not feel compelled to go along with this game? Because probably it is costlier, costlier to interpret things that way, go after the efficient results, get empirical data, wherever you can, than simply interpreting the literal uh, form of the rule. And um, in most cases, you might say, those law texts reflect compromises amongst opposing interests. And in the best case, of course, they have the actual efficient solution. But at all events, when there's a dispute, uh, people have been relying on text, do not want the text to be reopened for interpretation. So they want the, r the rules to be frozen in. What does that mean? It means that the hermeneutic approach, the traditional lawyering approach, has a comparative cost advantage, I think, over um, 
lawn economics uh, for the run of the mill cases. Oh, question. That's, that's a bad message to pass on in this audience, but let's go on. Uh, it wins the day all right, but then what's the role for lawn economics? Now, let's speculate a bit more now here. You can always trace the consequences of new or alternative rules. And you may find, in all events, you may find that helpful. Think the unthinkable, think outside the box. And that may help with gap-filling exercises and perhaps somewhere else. And uh, for scholarship, we always want to show the system. And so uh, lawn economics can help you show how rules hang together. But there's more. I think uh, lawn economics sharpens lawyers' intuition of what's at stake in a negotiation, the interests of both parties. If you want to draft a contract that is, or if we want to draft contracts that are less prone to litigation, surely we must be aware of what's at stake for both parties. And lawn economics helps you focus on just that. Um, now, often it's been told, actually I remember um, for some of us, um, I, I went to a conference uh, where Lisa Bernstein was present. Lisa Bernstein has studied uh, the emergence of law amongst trading communities. And her father was there with her. And so we, I, I had invited her to a conference earlier. So I got into conversation with the two of them. And, and Lisa was called away. And so I continued to talk with the father, who is a law practitioner. And he said, well, I follow what my daughter is doing. And I find it extremely interesting because it sort of confirms intuitions that I've developed over the course of my practice. We said, that is a very interesting idea. If lawn economics tags on to things that lawyers develop while practicing, negotiating deals, uh, formulating complex contracts, then maybe this is a powerful way of passing these insights on to younger people in a very efficient way, time-efficient way. Uh, so it should be a plus in a job application. And if you are somebody who hires students, look for whether they got a lawn economics course. That probably is a plus point. And last thought, um, in a globalizing world, what will be the key tools? They will not necessarily be knowledge of positive law, which you learned by heart and then repeated at the exam. Because in the globalizing world, what drives um, the way, what drives movements forward are contracts contracts among um, people that are in very different cultures. How do we prepare people for it? Well, by just those tools, understanding other people, being open to how other people think their interests and uh, where other people have their uh, fears of being trapped or being hired. Um, so for, these, for this movement, globalization, I think law and economics once more provide helpful tools better to be able to cope. So I conclude. I'm still within my time. I think law and economics is an important legal development. It's not a mere fad. Why do I dare say that? Because if you look at the comparable movements, the critical legal stu uh, studies movement has petered out. Law and feminism integrated what useful insights they had, petered out. And you go through the gamut of new intellectual movement that in particular American legal scholarship has gone up with. Um, law and economics is probably the only one that has an enormous staying power. There was a generation of the pioneers. You're amongst them, Posner. But there's now a generation of the sons of that generation who have taken over and do again significant work. And if you go through the various countries, there are enormous numbers of doctoral theses now being written on the subject. There are textbooks all over. There are 10 journals that produce lively stuff. So this movement is still alive and kicking. It's an important intellectual... One of the things law and economics does, very important, is that it focuses on tricky questions. Should blood be sold? It focuses debate on specific questions rather than leaving them in abstract terms. 
and that sometimes helps people solve a problem that otherwise looked insoluble. Opens the way to empirical research. New, we can finally know what we should look at. And in a number of cases, we have come up with interesting new insights that we didn't expect. It's a cousin to comparative law, and um, it allows, as we already said, think the unthinkable. But what's most important is perhaps these last two things. Law and economics does not replace traditional legal scholarship. It blends into it. It's complementary. If you go, if you went through the curricula of American law schools and more and more ours as well, Canada, you may not find courses in law and economics. Why do you not find them? Because the insights have been integrated in the courses. If you, talk a co if you teach a course on property rights, real rights, the tragedy of the commons is an element of your demonstration. And if you talk about information problems, the market for lemons is a story that you'll carry on to students. It's integrated, as it should be. And so my closing message will be, for lawyers, it should be, I could think, at least advisable, if not almost mandatory, to have both sets of skills. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor McKay. Now we have some minutes for questions, comments. Uh, Professor McKay, you said that law and economics movement had a strong influence, at least in the United States. This influence has been, of course, quite strong in private law. But what happened in uh, public law, especially, I mean, constitutional law? I ask this question because in constitutional law, a lot of questions don't deal with which is the rule, which is the more efficient rule, but which is the more fair rule, the fairest rule. So would you say that law and economics is also useful in deciding these questions about human rights, civil rights, uh, which are quite common in constitutional law? Um, I, I think in, in public law, we also, we very definitely have interesting insights, and if you just, take a first example, the economics of federalism is a very lively literature and has very uh, interesting practical insights to propose to people. When the South Africans finally uh, reorganized their state, we said you need a federal system given the diversity of interests and ethnic groups you have there and languages. And they did and the, the system seems to work. So that's a helpful insight. There is a lively literature on the um, economics of fundamental rights. I've contributed a piece to it. There's a lively literature on the economics of administrative law, which is essentially characterized by agency problems of sorts. And agency problems are part of the tools that um, you learn as, as uh, a basis in law and economics insights. So uh, while I suppose the most convincing cases for law and economics initially, if you have to explain it to somebody, are uh, corporate law. Corporate law is absolutely stunning. It was stuffy, dull in the 1950s and 60s, and then Henry Manny came out with his inside trading things. People start to worry about why we suddenly have limited liability. That field has been totally turned around. It's one of the most booming fields now. Tort law, civil liability law. Very interesting case to show that uh, uh, law and economic scholarship has totally changed our view of uh, what's happening there. Rather than say, for instance, as uh, my colleagues in, in uh, the big textbook in Quebec on civil liability laws says, that branch of law uh, serves to compensate victims of an accident. I try to talk them out of this, say, look, if that were the point, just create a, a public compensation system, right? And New Zealand did that, and it was a disaster. So 20 years later, they abolished it. But that means that that law has a function which we can trace and which we should understand. So, um, but to come back to your original question, I think in public law, there are things to be learned. Uh, people do have uh, scholarship, as I remember a German piece by a woman in Germany or in Switzerland, about public international law and different insights that you could have with law and economics uh, tools. So do not despair. <laughs> Thank you. 
Second question, please. No, I was thinking that maybe if possible, replacing uh, traditional legal uh, formalism for law and economics might, might not be even efficient because legal culture is a complex of a supper game with a lot of equilibriums that being developed through history and accumulated experience. But you, you, you can still think as an economist and speak as a lawyer. And, and in my opinion, that gives a strong, powerful, uh, uh, a strong uh, uh, the analytical framework in which a lawyer can, be, can uh, really uh, improve uh, their practice. No? But I remember, for example, Buchanan thinks that uh, law and economics is more useful for legislation than for practicing. And they, maybe that could be an interesting difference. No? And also, I think that, for example, there are some cases which uh, have a lot of external effects and the uh, real is not very clear. And also, you might find conflicting uh, rules in that area. And what I've seen that, for example, in, in, in the cases in, in the Supreme Court, those cases, they always tend to include some kind of uh, economic reasoning because of the strong legal effects of the decision, because of the, normally they find conflicting rules, or maybe there's no rule, or maybe the way you have to interpret the rules is not so clear. So I might tend to think that economics argument might be more, uh, re uh, have a, a strong reception maybe uh, when you legislate, or maybe when you have a case in, in the Supreme Court, or when a, big cases where have a strong external effects or rules are not clear. And also you have still have a major distinction, uh, distinguishing different areas of law, no? Some areas with economics more explicit, no? But I don't know, it's maybe a general well, idea I, have. I, 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 I'm with you all the way if you say that for competition law, you want to be aware of economic insight to, to be useful at all. My submission to you has been, even if you're in traditional law practice, you may be a better lawyer, a better negotiator, a better contract drafter if you have these kinds of insights. I'm also with you to say that maybe the direct application of these insights is more prevalent when you talk about new legislation. But when the new problems, for instance, um, things that have newly become scarce, right? Body organs, should those be tradable? What happens if you prevent trade? You can always say, um, yeah, but if you prohibit these things, you get a black market, and we can tell you something about black market. You can virtually always, uh, with law and economics insights, you can say something about the effects of particular decisions. So, let me leave it at that, because... Thank you very much, Professor McKay. And Thank you.